Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Ala Dunim in Israel. Fear is one of the truly basic emotions. It is about as primitive as, as things get when it comes to deep-rooted feelings. There is no question that its source lies deep within the structure of the brain, among the sections that exist in many of the lower forms of animals and perhaps some reptiles. We are all familiar with fear some more than others. It is not something we ever truly wish to feel, but there doesn't seem to be all that much we can do about its presence. It pops up unannounced and unbidden, almost as if it runs the joint. The emotion of fear is utterly fascinating if we can ever manage to think about it on an objective level, disconnected to the sense of dread it generates. It is a startling feeling, capturing our entire being perhaps like no other emotion. We can be so taken by fear that it makes all else seem irrelevant in comparison, even love and boredom. It is almost as if another being has taken over the mind. Yet we accept this state as affairs as if it is the most normal thing imaginable. And the fact is that it is the most normal thing imaginable. This is simply the way we are. Fear is unquestionably rooted in the fundamental drive for survival. That all-encompassing pull is universal to life, but the dread of its ending only exists within living things that have the capability to know such things. To be blissfully unaware of the dangers faced in the course of life sometimes seems enviable. Little children are this way, and we occasionally find ourselves observing their carefree lives with a mixture of envy and admiration. But the higher animals were not given this luxury for very long periods of time. Very soon, perhaps almost immediately in the case of most animals, we learn that life is precarious and is always one step away from slipping away. This is where fear comes from. In a sense, it is the mind truly confronting reality with no blinders. Human beings have learned to somehow shut this perpetual sense of doom off most of the time. This is a great skill that is essential for a happy and fulfilling life. It may not be something that is acquired or learned as much as a relic from childhood, but the ability to shut off fear is as important as is fear itself. We need fear to be aware of the dangers we face as living things, and we need to be able to ignore it to be able to live as human beings. Fear has certainly accompanied us every step of the way of our journey down from the trees. If anything, the development of the human species has been one long experience of living with fear and learning to live without it. It is this odd combination of emotional awareness and ignorance that, in a sense, defines us as individuals. Everything else, to some degree, is a byproduct of that emotional mixture. Our ability is to love and to think and to imagine and to simply simply sit back and smell the flowers all stem from this combination of confronting reality and remaining oblivious to it. We need to know our own mortality in order to actually accomplish anything in the world, but we need to be able to ignore it if we hope to get anything done. On a personal note, I live in Israel. As everyone knows, we have been at war for the past 10 months. As many people know, for the past week or so, we have been living in a somewhat surreal state of dreading what is apparently an inevitable bombing attack from our enemies to the north and possibly to the south and pretty much everywhere else. We have been assured that this attack is as expected as the sunrise. We don't know when or exactly where it will take place, but we have convinced ourselves that it is, it is as good as done. It is a very strange condition to live in. It is like perpetually walking down a dark alley, knowing the whole time that danger lurks everywhere. It is fear on steroids. Yet surprisingly, nobody seems to be all that affected by it, at least on the surface. Nobody is going crazy or predicting doom or confessing their sins before they die. Everybody seems to be going about life exactly as they have done the past 10 months, or perhaps like before the war ever started. There is no evidence of fear anywhere, even though everyone is fully aware of the situation. What could bring about such a strange state of affairs? Is it willful ignorance? Is it like the band playing on the Titanic as it was going down? Is it supreme confidence in the army or devout trust in God? It is probably a combination of all of those, plus a healthy dose of Israeli skepticism of the power of fate. 
more than anything else, we are probably a textbook example of that weird combination of basic fear and the human ability to put it on the back burner. This week's Parsha is called Devarim. That word means things or words. It is the first Parsha of the final book of the Torah, also called Devarim, but better known as Deuteronomy. The word Deuteronomy itself means second law or something to that effect. The reason Deuteronomy was given this name comes from a certain phrase that appears in the middle of the book, Mishneh Torah, which means something like repeat of the Torah. Deuteronomy is, in a sense, a repeat of the Torah. The first few parshas are essentially a retelling of the main events that happened to the Israelites after the Exodus, all the way up to the point where they are about to enter the Promised Land. The second third of the book is a rehashing of many of the laws that were given in earlier books, plus many new laws that were never seen previously. The final third is a long prophetic outlook of the future of the Israelites and the fate that awaits them if they follow or do not follow the Torah. Getting back to this week's Parsha, it is always read immediately before Tisha B'Av, the National Jewish Day of Mourning. Tisha B'Av commemorates the destruction of both temples that stood on the same spot in Jerusalem from between about 3,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago. While that may seem like an impossibly distant time to be commemorating, in Judaism it is very real and very relevant. Jews, to some degree, have persevered the past 2,000 years through the recollections of what life was like when those temples stood, and with the dream that someday another temple would be built on that very spot. Tisha B'Av reminds us of the destruction, but it also carries a strong sense of the hope of restoring what once was. This Parsha contains much of the history of the 40 years of wandering in the deserts to the south and east of the present land of Israel. For Jews, these obscure tracts of wilderness are as real as the local shopping mall. Even though most Jews have never been to these places and would have trouble surviving a single night camped out in the area, they count these wanderings as part of their own personal history. These journeys are laid out in the Parsha as a series of places through which the Israelites passed. Included within the retelling is the ill-fated plan to send out spies before entering the land of Canaan. The Parsha tells how everyone backed this plan, including Moshe, who was telling the account. It was the way the spies described what they were to be up against and the reaction of fear within the Israelites that it inspired that resulted in the divine decree that the entire generation would have to wander through the wilderness and never actually enter the land. These wanderings and the various battles and conflicts they faced make up the rest of the Parsha. There is a verse towards the beginning of the Parsha, right before the incident of the spies, which encapsulates the Torah's attitude towards fear of an upcoming challenge. Quote, See, Hashem your God has placed before you the land. Ascend and possess it, as Hashem the God of your ancestors spoke to you. Do not fear and do not worry. Right after Moshe speaks these words, the suggestion is given to send out the spies. Well, there doesn't appear to be anything wrong with this suggestion, and the Torah states explicitly that Moshe himself approved of the idea. What happened as a result was a catastrophe of biblical proportions. It is impossible to escape the impression that the sending of the spies directly opposed the admonition of do not fear and do not worry. Sending out spies was a reasonable thing to do. It was intelligence gathering. There was nothing wrong with the idea. It does not demonstrate any excess fear or paranoia. It is the best way of meeting the upcoming challenge. So what went wrong? This is a classic example of the famous statement, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. This was a good idea. It should have worked. Moshe was directly involved in appointing the spies and charging them with their mission. The problem was, perhaps, that the spies and the people as a whole went into the mission with a sense of fear. They didn't know how the whole thing would work out. They were worried, as any normal group would be upon embarking upon a major challenge. That fear and that worry infected both the spies and the Israelites with an attitude of negativity that permeated their minds. When they spied out the land, they saw both a beautiful area with vast potential and a challenge that was too great to overcome. Like any self-fulfilling prop self prophecy, they were proven correct. 
They were unable to overcome this challenge and they died without ever really attempting to do so. This is an amazingly clear example of how fear takes over both the individual mind and the collective mind of a large group. It spreads like wildfire, afflicting all who come in its path. It is powerful because it is so fundamental to our nature. We need fear to survive, but it paralyzes us when we need to get on with the business of living. Those Israelites were unable to get past this very human obstacle, even with Moshe's explicit reminder of do not fear and do not worry. That reminder simply wasn't enough to enable them to put aside their fears and worries. This is a very human way of reacting, but it is also quite tragic. We have to face fears every single day of our lives. They may not be existential fears like those hovering over the minds of the modern Israelis this past week. They may not be of the magnitude that ancient Israelites faced upon contemplating the great challenge of conquering their promised homeland. They may be more basic, like paranoia about an upcoming task or facing a nil hill to climb in the course of life. Sometimes we can dismiss these fears by a simple reminder of don't worry. But sometimes that won't do the trick, and we have to resort to other methods, such as ignoring those fears as if they weren't there. Fear is one of the great constants of life. It makes us human even as it connects us to our animal roots. Without it, we would be reckless. But fear doesn't have to be something that holds us back from real living. It is all a matter of recognizing that God is there with us to help us overcome the challenges and realizing that we have the inner strength to push our fears aside. Shabbat Shalom.